many of the clans have. The, the clan crest hat is like their highest tattoo of the clan, and it's used in the ceremonies um, throughout time. All the quakes it has gone to, um, and it represents their, their clan. He tells about how it came into existence, but then, you know, we have to just sit and wonder how many parties had it been to, how many times it had been held out in comfort of, of the opposite side in, when they were in, in mourning, and how much of the, um, how many names have been called through it, how, how many people does it hold up, and it, it represents their whole clan. Now, the clan is small today. Um, they're, they're trying to get a full count, but compared to other clans, compared to the Kiksadi, compared to the Aguantans, and compared to, um, you know, KQDs or Duck Thing Tong. It's a small, it's a small claim. Um, and, and the actual matrilineal lineage falls like primarily through Deborah's family and through my, my cousins on the right heart side um, and then down to Mike. Um, <clears throat> there's, so there's not, not a lot of that. There's a lot of adopted people in their clan. Um, but the, the uh, Clan Crest Hat was something that I grew up um, back in 1977. I went fishing with my dad to Bristol Bay. We left Wrangell and we stopped in Juneau. I forget if it was on the way up or the way back. I think it was on the way back. And we went and looked at the hat in the museum. And um, he told me about it. And um, you know, he told me that he's the caretaker of it. Over time, um, you know, in, in there, there was a, like a, a feeling that it should come back to Wrangell, and what he always said was, when Wrangell built a museum that can house it, can keep it, and has a facility that can take care of it, that it needs to come back to Wrangell. And then they built the Nolan Center in Wrangell, and he really felt that it was time that the, the hat come back to, to Wrangell where it belongs. So to us, like, <clears throat> go to the one that had the map. To us, um, we feel, yeah, there's a hat. We, we feel pretty strongly that the hat is tied into the region. Um, as you know, this is this is Wrangell and the Sticking River. This area in here, there's two creeks there. Um, one was Mill Creek and the other is Crickman Creek is what they call them today. I forget what your Tunket names are exactly, but um, Mill Creek is a short creek. There's a sal salmon stream that has um, Virginia Lake up above it. That was a site of a, a village um, when the, when the uh, people came back under the ice and they came back down to settle into these areas again after after the glaciers receded. And you know, we all have the migration story of where it came under the ice and went to Wrangell and then spread around um, many of the clans spread around southeast Alaska. Uh, when they first set, settled in there, the, the Raven people, and at some point there was a fight or a battle. Um, within the family, and part of that family, you, you probably already told this, split off and they moved over to um, Crickman Creek area, which is only, it's like a mile. It's not very far. Um, but it's another big salmon stream, and, it's, and the, you can see where it's a good area to build, to build a house. They started out near Cedar Bark House. So that's the area they started. And then, I don't know if you already pointed this, this all out, um, Lake Bay, is it right in here? Lake Bay is near Kaufman Cove today, and the air, this, this area he's talking about, it's a tidal lake, and there's a river, and there's actually waterfalls that it creates um, when the tide's going out. And, and um, so this is the area where, where the um, hat first came into existence, but it, it was, you know, there was blood drawn, it was paid for in blood, basically. Um, and this whole area, that, the feeling of the, the Teton is that, you know, they're tied to the land, the hat belongs there, it belongs home in, in the site in Wrangell, not in the State Museum in Juneau. And so that was my father's feeling, and that's what we tried to do. So back in, um, somewhere in the 90s, he made some claim for it by basically writing a letter to see Alaska, and there's things that were said that or um, for one, like he wanted me to be the caretaker, I couldn't be the caretaker because I'm I'm not Tia Tom, so that that couldn't that could not work. Um, we, we changed that, but back in 2003, when I moved up here to go to work for Sea Alaska, I went over to the State Museum and 
let them know that we wanted to have the hat back. Um, they couldn't do that, so we said, well, we're going to fight for it then. And we started our, our name for claim. And um, we, we went about it over a fairly long period of time, had several meetings with the uh, officials from the state. And back and forth, they have had various directors of the museum. Um, I think Steve's been there probably throughout from the I think he was the first one who walked in and said, we want our hat back. And he said, I can't give it to you. He said, well, you know, we're doing it the easy way or the hard way. And unfortunately, they could only do it the hard way because they're under a lot of parameters and restrictions on things they can do and things they can't do. Um, and um, we went through it. We, we filed an egg for claim, um, went back to Washington, D.C., testified there. Um, felt that we had won the case, it was, there was no decision was actually written um, officially that I've seen. Um, it, the state of Alaska wasn't going to go by it anyway. They, they have um, NAGPRA works where this, the um, U.S. government funds money to a museum, it's a state museum. Um, the state of Alaska is, uh, and <clears throat> this kind of gets to be a touchy issue for them. The state of Alaska is, uh, run under a, um, Steve might have to help me out on this, it's a committee or it's a group of people that are um, appointed, I believe, by the governor. They serve in a term and it's a board that watches over. Museum Collections Advisory Committee. The Museum and Collections Advisory Committee. They're pretty powerful, apparently. And they sort of set the way things go. Um, they're not like subject to listen to any particular governor because they're, they get appointed by a prior one or, and they sit on, on this board. The board only meets a couple times a year and decides to hear things or not, so it's a fairly slow process. Um, we were fortunate, and I'll, I'll give a lot of uh, respect to um, Bob Banghart, the, the um, museum director that came in, was willing to deal with us, couldn't. He had to do what worked with the committee. Um, then we got Governor Parnell's office involved, and through um, Randy Raro primarily, and then John Moeller, one of the, there's some key people on the staff of the governor's office, their help. Um, the governor's office put pressure on the museum and, and the committee, and, and uh, they, you know, between political pressure and I think they always sensed that it was the right way to do it. We were able to come to an agreement. We. Spence engaged some things. Um, Deborah can talk about that agreement in full and how it how it came out in, in the end. Um, <clears throat> but I, I guess I want to back up a little bit and talk about why why would we um, go to this agreement and have a, a we have like this joint agreement with this with the State Museum, also the Rainbow Museum, the Nolan Center is involved, the museum is involved with the two. But the reason to have a museum take care of it is because it doesn't make sense to sit in Deborah's house or Mike's house or Ethel's house and not have the preservation that you'd have in a museum. And I think the sense is that we're proud of it and we'd like to share it with the public and let them see it. Um, but we want to have that care that a museum can give it. And so there is this willingness to work with the museum as long as they can acknowledge that it's the clan that has ownership and rights and control of it. So they came up with a unique um, way that they work together with the museum, and like I said, Deborah can talk about how that agreement got finalized. Um, any questions on, on any of that? There, there, it's, it's a long process. The NAGPRA claim is a, is a big legal document. Um, attorneys write things back and forth pretty extensively, um, and, and there's, there's really, like I said, there's really a lot that goes to it. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and talk about yeah. the agreement. Sometimes attorneys can make things a lot more complicated than they really need to be, and I, and I say that as an attorney. Um, yeah. Um, before I get started, I also want to, and I, and I should have done this at the beginning, I'd like to um, acknowledge that my mom is sitting in the back, Carol, and thank her for coming and, and supporting us. And it's um, through her that I'm uh, Tiatan, and through her mother, 
um, who was um, Tilly Paul Tamry from Wrangell um, that uh, helped, is carrying on the um, clan lineage. So um, thanks for coming. Um, as Richard said, the, um, the NAGPRA made a decision and then following that, then the, the um, museum collections. And I, this morning I pulled out all these documents just to um, remember, remind myself of what happened. And it was um, a little interesting, this museum um, uh, advisory committee um, we played its role as well in um, helping fashion a negotiation. And really, um, if you can, if we had to do a cartoon, we would have, um, back probably five years ago, there would have been um, a bone in the middle with the, with the clan on one end pulling this way and the museum pulling this way and literally trying to pull the bone in half or the baby in half. And there was, there was no, um, we weren't gonna give up um, our right to ownership and whatever we, whatever we um, settled on needed to acknowledge that um, this was claimed property. Um, it wasn't my property or Richard Reinhardt Sr.'s property it belonged to the claim. Um, and I think that with the whole process we were actually able to do that. If you read the Museum Advisory Committee's docu final document, um, it's actually partial, which I, even back in, um, when was this, in 2011 when they came, I'm not quite sure what they mean by partial accession of the hat, but I think again it was a face saving for the museum to, to use that legal technical terminology. Um, but in reality what we ended up with was um, a negotiated agreement with the State Museum <coughs> acknowledging that the hat is the property of the clan. That's what we wanted. And that's what we ended up with, which is great. We made it clear, as Richard said, from the get-go that we were not interested in removing the hat from the museum. The hat had actually already burned up and had to be replicated once already. And it's one thing that we didn't want to have, we didn't want to run the risk of, have, of doing that again. And in addition to keeping it safe, we also feel very strongly mm -hmm. about it staying <coughs> in Juno. And none of us live, I mean, right. staying in Wrangell. And none of us live in Wrangell right now. So, but it needed to stay in Wrangell where it originated and be available um, for folks who live there um, and visit there to be able to see and learn from the hat. And they couldn't do that if it was in one of our homes and not in the museum. So um, I think it's a great, um, and I gotta turn on the, my tired eyes are, I can't see in the, in the dark. But there's, cause there's some things that I actually wanna read in here. And um, for anybody who is, um, I'll just make this up. I didn't bring copies um, today, but um, I'll be happy to give you my email address or write down your email address if anybody wants copies of this use agreement as a template if you're looking at doing any kind of arrangement. Some clans, when they go about the process of repatriation, they take possession of it and keep it. And, and you'll see um, at a lot of our ceremonies and events and, and gatherings that, um, that um, items are kept in people's homes. Um, and we decided that that wasn't the best for our, for, for us, for all the reasons we've already said. Um, so everybody, every clan's going to have a different arrangement or a different desire or a different way. So this is just one. And, um, and again, we wanted it to be available at the, in the Wrangell Museum for those who live in Wrangell as well. Um, the document clearly says that we have right to possession, even though it is housed in Wrangell. Any one of us can um, go to, once we notify the, the um, uh, museum that we uh, want to take the hat out for a, a, um, a ceremony or an event, or even just a gathering. It could be just a, it could be something like this, um, that we bring the hat out. Um, 
though I had I had asked Mike, I'm just going to jump in there. We um, this is just an aside. We did not bring a hat with us today for this conference primarily because we haven't done a, a proper honoring and memorial for Richard Senior, who was the previous um, caretaker of the hat, and we hope to um, do that this next spring or fall. The date is still getting negotiated with some of the other plans in, in Wrangell um, so that we can properly honor um, Richard Senior. And until we've done that, we actually aren't able to bring the hat out for event, events or gatherings or ceremonies. Though I have to say, a, a, an exception was made at the Shakes Island rededication. Um, but exceptions are really that, just exceptions. Okay. Um, there was, during our talks, there was a lot of emphasis, and it's written into this agreement, that the parties um, share the responsibility of taking care, the parties being the clan and the museum, share the responsibility of taking care and protecting the hat, but also making it available for educational and ceremonial purposes. And again, that was very important. It's important to the museum, who's all about preservation and education, but it was also important to us as we are a small clan who is just, um, as Richard said, lots of our um, clan members have, have married outside of, of um, and moved down south. So, and some of us are starting to come back. So as we come back, we want to have it available so that we can um, educate um, the younger generation as they're coming in. So that's emphasized in this agreement. We also have a unique two-lock system. And um, the museum very generously built a very particular um, display box just for the hat. And it actually has two locks on it that requires two keys to open it up. The clan, me, has one key, and the museum has another key. So the museum can't take the hat out to use it or move it or do whatever without asking us, can we do that? And then also for safekeeping, we need to negotiate and notify the, the um, museum if we need to take it out, which the last time was for Chief Shake's um, rededication, the Chief Shake's house rededication. And um, I'll tell you, it was the first time that we did it and it went uh, seamlessly. It was very um, easy. There was no um, um, glitches that I can see that, um, that happened. So there's a mutual respect for the, for the two parties of um, be, having access to the hat. Whoever has possession of the hat, whether it's the museum or us, we take full responsibility for it. And I can tell you, so, just as a, an aside of the to just illustrate the process where we were, and it was about three years, a three year process, maybe four, to get to it. One of the early drafts of this use agreement included very detailed um, instructions of what we as the clan had to follow in order to keep the hat safe and in good shape and that we would be required to replace it if something happened to it. That language isn't there anymore. Partly because that's, a, that's coming from an assumption that the, that the hat is the property of the museums. So it's not. And if, the, if we took the hat out, I don't, we would have to decide if we wanted to replace it or not if something happened to it, if it got burned down again. We weren't, it's our property. So, I think the other thing that, um, and again, this is where my, my legal eyes catch some things, um, on the caretaking of the hat when it's in our possession, um, instead of using the word must, um, those kind of very definitive um, um, words have been replaced with in this document as may with me. Um, 
The other thing that I want to also thank the museum for, and I think it's already been done, Steve maybe can, can jump in if it hasn't, but a um, box is going to get constructed if it hasn't already been that can be used to um, um, travel with the hat if it's going to, for instance, if it was going to come over here to Juneau for, for um, an event um, and the museum was, was going to help us build a, a traveling hat that would keep it safe and, and travel well. Hopefully that would be big enough to fit inside an airplane, not <laughs> in the luggage. <laughs> we don't want to put it in the luggage. Um, <clears throat> so I think those were the main things um, that were that are a part of this. Um, it came, it was long in getting developed. I encourage anybody who's interested or who is involved with any repatriation or caretaking of any of your clan um, property or artifacts to. Um, add, uh, come up and see me and I'd be happy to send you a copy of this use agreement. It's, it's um, when we were negotiating it, it was a, a document that we talked about amongst ourselves as well as with the museum about making it available as a model to be used by others um, if that's the route that they wanted to take. And um, so there. Any questions on that? Yeah. Not a question. <laughs> Any questions on the use? Uh, you said that the, the use be emphasized for educational and ceremonial purposes. Is there, I mean, you, you have your possession of it if you want it, um, I assume, but if there was a conflict between education and ceremony, would ceremony, for example, come out on top, or? I would guess so, yes. I, I yeah. But you know, the communication and it, the communication right now is so open and respected and mutual that I, I feel pretty confident that we would be able to work out any scheduling conflict. And um, um, there was one incident, and it was a um, it was a party that was going to be here in June, and. Mike and I talked about it, Mike Ethel and I actually talked about it probably three days before this event was to occur, which is pretty short notice. And we were, we were talking amongst ourselves, really the hat should be here. Let's see if we can get it. I called up Bob Banghart, this is three days before the event, to ask him what, if, if it was even possible to get it transported over to Juno to, to have it present at this event. And he called, he contacted me at 6.30 the next morning. So he, his response back was really fast. Um, and we talked on the phone, and we were actually going to have Ken bring it over. Um, he was going to get a box for it, and we were going to have it all, and they were going to come over the very next, the, it was like a, anyway, it was going to happen two days later and be here in time. And, there was no, um, I don't think I had time to get the form filled out to say who, who's authorized to take it out, but we all, we did it just talking on the phone. Now it turned out that we didn't bring the hat over because we hadn't, we have not yet properly honored um, Richard Sr., our past caretaker. Um, so we did not, but I have to tell you, I was very impressed with um, the swiftness and the, um, accommodations that the museum, that, that Bob Van Hart was making to ensure that we could have access to it. So. I think one of the um, givers offered to, to, you know, use this agreement as a template and anybody interested in setting up use agreements with the museum should look at it. Um, it was, like she said, it was crafted over a period of years. Um, several um, versions went back and forth. And uh, you know, fortunately for the plan, they had an attorney on their side. Um, and on the other side of the state had the Attorney General's office. Although everything is nice and smooth right now, the, the problem um, that we were trying to foresee, and, and both sides are working this way, is this thought that we don't know 
20 years, 50 years, 100 years from now, how things will work. And that's why it was to try to get the right wording, craft it to where it would honor the um, role and intentions of the plan and still work within the parameters and guidelines that the museum felt that they, they needed to have. And, and so that was important. And that's what that document, that document really, really does. Um, is, does anybody have any other, other questions or thoughts? I, I mean, I know you're here for a reason, so you must be looking at a repatriation or you're just interested in how it works. Well, I, did, I did want to talk about the ceremonial okay. importance of uh, why this is so um, so crucial to who we are. Um, I'll try to find the right slide for you. So this is the rededication of the Chief Sheikh's house back in the 1940s. Uh, they had moved to, uh, from uh, what we call Old Town, now they moved to modern day Rainbow um, in the 1840s. And so it was a rededica rededication of the house. And it's at events like these that uh, these important objects, these who come out. Um, so here's a picture, like I said, 18, uh, sorry, 1940. This is a picture uh, on the, this would be on your guys' left. Uh, it's my great-great-grandfather, um, Gunanesti, uh, Rock Dalsin. And then on the right is uh, pictures from the rededication just this past summer. Um, welcoming uh, the canoes. Here's a photo of uh, Richard Reinhardt Sr., Dave Cook, uh, wearing the hat, using it at um, at the ceremony for this was the Keep Nakane, the Killer Whale Flotilla Row. Um, this was in, I want to say 2008, is that correct? Okay. Yeah, 2008. November 2008. Uh, you can see the, the robe itself uh, over there on the left, and uh, Richard is holding it. Um, this is, uh, the, the robe belongs to the Nanya uh, and then on the right uh, is uh, their, their clan hat being held over uh, one of their members, and uh, Richard Jr. over here is actually holding it as well. Just as a little side note, I traveled in on a plane that that came in on, it had its box, it had its own seat on the airplane. <laughs> It's currently housed at the uh, Burke Museum at University of Washington, Seattle. On the right is a blanket. Uh, this is um, anti, uh, sorry, on the left. Um, anti Marsh has a blanket. I think that blanket has got to be about 100 years old. That, um, that blanket and that Totilla robe were both um, brought out at the um, 18, I think it's 1895. Uh, potlatch they had in Wrangell, same time that they raised the, what they call the Chief Shakes totem. That's actually a, a raven totem pole for Chief Shakes son. Mm -hmm. but that, those two kind of came out at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then on the right, uh, the right is uh, what do they call it, the uh, raven's backbone uh, staff. It's another one of the uh, kicks out in Wrangell. Uh, this is a photo of the rededication in Wrangell this past summer. These are photos of the hats that uh, were brought out for the rededication on the right. Um, the reason I wanted to talk about those uh, different ceremonies is because these um, objects, they're not, and I even hesitate to use the word object, uh, to call them objects or to put them, to leave them in museums would be uh, tragic. Uh, it's a, a very, that's not what they're meant for. They're beautiful pieces of art, yes, but they're not meant to be uh, purely booked at. They're meant to be brought out at these ceremonies. You know, these things were brought out, um, like Richard said, uh, back in 18, uh, 1895 for that whole reason. They were brought out in uh, 1940s for the Chief Shakes rededication then, and they were brought out again for the rededication this past summer. Um, 
and I think that really highlights uh, the sense of difference in um, perspective of something that is uh, static, I'd say, versus something that is alive. Um, these objects, these these hats, you know, they're they're alive, and and that when we bring them out, they're connected to who who we are collectively as a clan, and not only the members as we are today sitting before you right now, but the members that have uh, taken care of these things and that were remembered for these things in the past. Uh, and so when we bring these out, you know, like I said, this is just this past year. Um, it's not just uh, you know, me standing there with the hat Richard Reinhardt Sr. is there with us, and uh, Louis Paul is there with us, William Paul, Nick Cash, I mean, it, the list goes on and on, all the way back, you know, um, and that's why these things are important, because these these people, you know, our clan has been intermarried with the non the ones that were doing this rededication, uh, like I said, at least eight generations back that I've been able to, you know, tell. Um, so it's a vital, absolutely vital importance for us to be able to have these and bring them out at these ceremonies, to be able to support our opposites like that. Um, I'm looking at these hats right now, I'm trying to think. And, uh, I guess it's probably hard for you guys to see the hats, but I mean, on the far right is a Deji Kong hat. Next to it is uh, a young lady hat. Next to that would be a Siknachadi hat. Uh, next to that is a Kiksabi hat. Uh, next one after that is another uh, young Yehidi hat, uh, followed by a Dukkawedi hat, um, and then a young Yehidi hat, and then Dukkawedi again, and then the Tiatan hat. And so you see like there's this, um, I don't know how else to say it except for, for connection, this interrelatedness that is Talk integral to, to who we are as a people, who we are as a clan. Um, it it ties with past, present, and future, like exactly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, I think what he said is it, it ties us to our past, our present, and our future, and that's absolutely correct. Um, and that's something that these things need to be uh, brought out and used for. Um, is that how, that picture on the left? Isn't that in the Sheikh's house in, with Chief Sheikh? Yeah, this is uh, this is Chief Sheikh's house on the left, um, and I included it. Uh, I know this this uh, this mask here, uh, much shark mask, is in the archives in uh, D.C. I also got to see that when I was there for NACPA. Um So kind of I guess highlight that distinction between you know these things that are in drawers, in these huge warehouses versus uh, things that are brought out and used and used to show our love and appreciation and our support for our opposites. Uh, it's a very different <coughs> approach. To, to um, stop for just a second, the um, Killer Royal Flotilla Road, which was in that 2008 ceremony, was when it came home. Um, you know, Carol came in and sat in the back, and he had a lot to do with the repatriation of that out of the Denver Art Museum. And I believe it was um, sitting, in, you know, it was in an archive, sitting in a drawer, not on display. Is that right, Harold? So here it was, clear down in Denver, Colorado, in the back of the museum in a drawer. And it's one of the, the key items of the non UAE plan. So, you know, to repatriate it now, it's home, it's proudly displayed, and it's used in ceremonies where it belongs. Another photo of uh, the past you know, rededication um, this past summer and seeing these, uh, again, I hesitate to use the word objects, but uh, seeing these hats uh, being used for, for the purpose. This is a, a photo I wanted to include. Um, this is a basketball camp we had in Rainbow this past summer. Um, and the reason I wanted to include it is because Rainbow is going through 
what I call a reawakening or a renaissance. Um, Matthew Marsh referred to Rainbow as a sleeping giant that is starting to wake up. You see it with the flotilla robe coming home in 2008, with the Teton hat, with the rededication. You see it with having basketball camps where 25 kids are coming and learning how to speak some thinking. Um, all of these things, they're, they're all intimately tied together, all very important. Um, Randall's waking up, and I think, uh, I think that's something we're all very, very excited to see. And I think it's all very important to why this hat is coming back and what that's moving for the community. It's making, uh, you know, in conjunction with all these other things that are happening. It's making people excited. It's making people, these kids want to come in, they want to learn about these things. And it's, uh, I'm at a loss for words, you know, just being able to be with these kids and asking them about, like, well, what do you guys learn about the Shakes House? What do you guys know? Um, and just seeing how eager they are to learn history, learn about the hat, learn about the house, learn about the language. It's, uh, it's so, so amazing. So that, that's, that's the things that I kind of see when I look at the hat, is, you know, it's, it's, it's beautiful art, but it's also our connection to our opposites, and it's also our connection between our past, our present, and our future. And this is our future right here, these are the people that are coming up behind us. These are the people that are learning about these things. And that's that's I guess why why we do it, to honor to honor our past, to honor those coming after us. So, I think that's the last thing I had in there. Is there any anybody have any questions? Yes, everybody's wondering why I'm sitting up here. I'm just, uh, uh, an object to admire. <laughs> <laughs> I really um, can see my role has been very limited, and uh, I provide encouragement and support. These people have done all of the hard work that took so many years. But it was a real learning experience for me. My grandson had to teach me the history of our clan. When I grew up in Wrangell, it was during a time when it wasn't, it wasn't such a good thing to be a native. And uh, we had little instruction um, on, on the clan system, on, on our families, on our names. The AB at that time taken the position that in order for us to survive that we would have to learn the Western ways quickly. So much was focused on that. But I didn't know the frog was my enemy. Um, that I was related to the Kiksadi. I knew uh, my grandmother was born in Norfolk. Uh, they, they had a village there. And um, she told me about growing up. Um, even at that early time, her sister and many of our people were shipped away to different schools and never came back. Uh, I picked up just pieces here and there and find out we have a really proud history as all of our clans. And that it's just essential that we teach this to our children, our young people. I remember studying Alaska history when I was in high school, half a century ago, that in the Alaska history book, the one thing I remember reading was that 
just look at Renaissance. We used to have bold, bold legs from being spending so much time in canoe. Well, I did a personal investigation and found that was not true. <laughs> <laughs> what we were taught, or what was there for us to perceive is not the best time. And it's been a real awakening to me, learning the pride that I feel when I learn about our tribal values and our way of life. I'm constantly amazed at the complexity of it, the whole heart and mind that went into the development of the various ceremonies we have, and the importance of the Afghan, because it's not just equipment, assets, it truly is expression of who we are. So we really rejoice. I um, was very happy to see the blanket there, which Deborah O'Gara made, that has a true reflection of, a, of that hat. I'm really happy to see those that came. To learn of our little clan, we're still, <laughs> we're still finding some misplaced <laughs> Tiatong people. We're prone to wonder. If you see any lost Tiatons, send them our way. Yeah, that, is, that, that is one thing I would add that this whole um, process did is it, it brought the clan together. And um, got them organized a bit. You know, they, they're, I don't know that they have a full role now, but they're, they're not, if you, I wouldn't say houses, but families. And Mike you sits there, represents Ethel's family. Deborah represents hers, Ben Paul, the, the Paul family, and Vince Reinhardt, the Reinhardt family, that are key, those that are key Um And so they're, they are organized that way, and you know, between them, they, they selected the caretaker, that's Deborah. Um, and and it, it, I think it's pulled the clan together quite a bit, the, the whole process. There is something to be said about um, a comment that my mother used to tell me. Uh, when I was growing up as a teenager, I often wondered what she meant. Uh, know who you are because there were times when I got into trouble and uh, I, I'd get into a fight and she would put me, uh, put, me uh, put me in the corner or uh, talk to me. And one of her things was don't ever forget who you are. So today it's something that I'm seeing happening uh, in, in Rhino that people are uh, have been fighting to get themselves established, getting one of their Apu back in the safekeeping of the State Museum, which is a good idea. But I see also that all of you are well founded in knowing who you are. And that's a good thing to see. I want to make that announcement. I apologize for the interruption, although. My roots are from Wrangell too, so it's nice to be around uh, my own people. The uh, program shows the dinner tonight. The Andrew Hope III tribute banquet is at seven, but that's not correct. It uh, starts at six. Oh. The tickets, I understand, also show that it's at seven, but it will be at six. Uh, you can come here at seven, but you might not be able to eat at that point. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it promises to be a very, very good evening. Uh, if you haven't purchased your tickets, I think you can purchase them at the registration desk or you can purchase them at the door also. 
thank you, and uh, really good to see the point. So I think we're going to end if there's not any other questions. I do want to let folks know that as soon as we have um, fulfilled our obligation of, of honoring um, Richard Sr., which, um, like I said earlier, we hope will be um, within the next year, we're looking at next spring as a possible date, um, then what we want to do after we've done that is um, do a public um, ceremony or event that acknowledges the, the um, recognition that the state um, has made that um, the hat belongs to the Klan and do a ceremonial handoff back and ask the uh, museum to help us to take care of it. So it'll be, I mean, what we're envisioning really is um, them handing us the hat and then us handing it back to them and asking them to help us to take care of it. So and we'll, we'll do that in Wrangell, but we haven't really started planning for that yet because we've got other obligations we have to um, do first. So do look for do look for more from the Teotihuacan as uh, we get ourselves organized and and, uh, and a little bit more together. Okay. Thanks, thanks everybody for coming. One one last oh, sorry, one last thing I guess wanted to to end on uh, myself. Just thinking back to the NACRA hearing and seeing some of the people here, I guess. Um, think about all the clans that were there uh, supporting us. And I've seen some of the people uh, here around uh, at the clan conference. Um, of course, we mentioned, you know, uh, Richard amongst the Kiksari was there. Uh, some from uh, the Tlukna Khadi and Tlukpa Khadi were there. Um, so we're going to choose for that. Um, there were Top 1 AD. And then uh, some Shangu KD were there. Uh, and then sitting in the back there, Hood uh, Gul Khan, the young Yadi, he was there. Um, and so I wanted to acknowledge those those clans and acknowledge uh, the support that they've given us. Um, that's what I guess uh, gave us the strength to, uh, to be able to, to do this. Um, the Duck Dane Tom were there as well. You mentioned that. Um, so thank you. Great, thanks. Thanks, Richard, for joining us. Sure. Mm -hmm. <clears> hey. <throat> <Okay. clears throat>